Mr. and Mrs. George Williams, 941 Elm Drive, Middale, Nebraska. Dear Mr. and Mrs. Williams, after reviewing your son's scholastic standing, we find that he has not improved his grade sufficiently to be removed from probation. Therefore, we regret to inform you that he will not be allowed to continue further study at this college. Very truly yours, Robert Anderson, Dean. Can you visualize a mother and father with this type of letter in their hands? Can you appreciate their feelings, the disappointment, the heartbreak, and the shattered dreams? As heartrending as it is, countless parents will receive letters like this this year. Here are the statistics. Of the four million students enrolled in college this year, over one million will drop without credit because of poor scholastic averages. I am with you now with one avowed purpose, to be certain that this trend does not continue, to see that this figure does not reach the predicted two million by 1970, to see that you are able to remain in college. You see, I, like millions of adults, truly believe in you, the youth of America. You will one day sit here in my place and attend the things we all know to be important. My work and the work of my colleagues will be praised or condemned by you. You will take over our government, our churches, our universities, and our corporations. Indeed, the future of this nation and of all humanity will lie in your hands. It is not my purpose today to analyze the unsuccessful student, to tell you where or how he erred in his responsibilities to himself, his parents, and his country nor could I if I wished. Let us rather make a blanket statement. He failed. He was unsuccessful in a most important quest. And let's make very certain that it does not happen to you. The tragedy, of course, is that he did not have to fail at all. Within himself, he had the ability to succeed if he had only known and understood the incredible workings of positive planning. These are not just two words. They're the keys to fulfill dreams, to realized ambitions, to consummated destinies. You have entered a college era which will determine to a great degree what your life will be like in future years. Will satisfaction, happiness, and self-respect be yours? Will you be a force for good in the world? Or will you be one of the losers, one of those fearful, frustrated, anxious people who couldn't quite make the grade and knows that he probably never will? Whether you build a castle or dig an emotional grave is going to depend strictly upon you and your own thinking in these important years ahead. Professor William James put it this way, a man can begin to know success when he is willing to look within himself for tendencies toward failure. And Marcus Aurelius said, a man's life is what his thoughts make of it. And the humble carpenter from Galilee, as ye believe, so shall it be done unto you. The greatest of the great have repeatedly told us that our success or failure will always be dependent on our own thinking, that you and I will always be directly responsible for the things that happen to us, whether in college, in the business world, or in the professional world. After graduation from high school, one semester late because of failing grades, I wondered, as many of you do, I'm sure, whether I would ever be college material. My high school background was one of constant failure and a notorious reputation for inability to follow through with anything. Later, at 18 years of age, I was stationed with the armed forces on a small island in the South Pacific. During this tour of duty, two significant things happened in my life. First, I met a doctor who was to give me the keys to success in college. He admonished me. Do these things and you will never have to worry about failure in college. I will pass along to you a similar eight-point program on the other side of this record, and I will admonish you. Do these things and you will never have to worry about failure in college. The second significant thing was this. I was allowed one year to think and plan about the problems that face me in the future. At first, of course, my failure complex was dominant. Although I wanted to be a doctor, 
I could not conceive how I could survive the rigors of seven or eight years of college without getting into trouble somewhere along the line. But as I dreamed and planned, slowly the realization came that no one in the world would or could destroy my chances for a college education except myself by not doing the job as I knew it should be done. Let me repeat and think of this. Isn't it remarkable that no one in the world can destroy your chances for success in college except yourself? You. You are the important person, and you are the key to your own success. And when you can harness the power of positive mental attitude with its vibrant dynamic force, it will play a magnificent role in your life and your thoughts and your actions. However, in order to use it, you must understand what I like to call the four horsemen of success. First, setting and attaining goals. Second, desire. Third, faith. And fourth, action. In other words, you must know where you're going. You must really want to get there. You must believe that you can. And you must be willing to take action in your own behalf. Before I go further, let me tell you about some other things that I have come to believe. And these thoughts apply particularly to college students. I believe that we are all capable of living, thinking, working, and achieving at a level of attainment not yet reached by any one of us. This is true regardless of our present age, our past experience, or our present estimates of ourselves, if we're willing to make the effort to find ourselves. I believe that the power of genius exists in every one of us, if we're willing to look for it. Genius is not necessarily intellect at all. It consists of hopes, dreams, and plans. It is realizing a worthy goal. It's building, striving, winning. It's common sense, foresight, and work. Alexander Hamilton said many years ago, men give me credit for genius. All the genius I have lies in this. When I have a subject at hand, I study it profoundly. Day and night it is before me. I study it in all its bearings. My mind becomes pervaded with it. Then the efforts that I make, people are pleased to call the fruits of genius. It is nothing more than the fruit of labor and thought. Success in college or any other venture is determined far more by mental attitude than by mental capacity. Let me show you what I consider genius in a college student, and you will see that it is readily within your grasp. First, I see a student who is happy because he's felt the thrill and satisfaction of growing more confident, more effective, and more successful day by day, week by week, and month by month. He has a sparkle that comes only with knowing that he's on the road to success and achievement. He's winning the most important battle that a man ever fights, the battle with himself. The biggest task that you and I will ever face is not to get ahead of others, but to surpass ourselves. I see the spark of genius in a student who thinks his present task is the most important thing in the world. You might have heard the old classic about the construction men. They were asked one day what they were doing. The first replied, what does it look like I'm doing? I'm pounding nails. The second said, I'm making $2.40 an hour. The third, however, thought for a moment, looked to the sky and said, I am building a cathedral. There is no question in my mind which man might become president of his company someday, because the man who thinks his work is important is constantly receiving signals on how to do a better job. Will you think enough of your task to work with honesty and sincerity each day, or will you hide behind the shaky refuge of crib notes and plagiarism? I know a man who cheated his way all through college and professional school, and won honors doing it. Successful? You bet. He has only two problems. He is totally despised by his colleagues, and one of the most unhappy men that I have ever met in my life. There are rules that cannot be broken. Let the counsel of thine own heart stand. Will you build a cathedral or a shanty? These are important questions. 
And of course, only you know the answers. Not too many years ago, a chaplain returned from service in Korea. He was asked this question. Reverend, what do you consider the attributes of a successful service chaplain? He thought for a moment and replied, Without question, I would say that it takes grace, grit, gumption, and guts. Guts is a harsh word. But I am convinced that it also takes guts to become a successful college student. Because it takes guts to say, no, I will not cheat because I am really cheating myself. Because it takes guts to do the job right, to go all the way. Because it takes guts to work while others play. Let's have the courage to be ourselves, to work, to strive, to use our brains and push our talents, whatever they might be, to the outer limits of capacity. Let's have the courage to be superb, to stand alone if necessary. And let's remember that the badge of mediocrity gains little recognition, respect, and no amount of noteworthy success. Success requires no apologies, and failure permits no alibis. Be proud of your ability to produce and organize. In genius, I see imagination in its greatest glory. I see a student who never asks, can I do it better? But how can I do it better? His questions are simple. How can I establish better study habits? How can I complete more work with greater efficiency? How can I become a better student? This student will find the answers. Somerset Maugham, the great author, commented not too long ago that man consists of body, mind, and imagination. His body is faulty, his mind is not trustworthy, but his imagination makes him truly remarkable. And you too can be a remarkable person if you will let your imagination soar, if you will give it the opportunity to make you truly effective. I see the appreciation of the value of time. You and I have three basic assets in our arsenal. Time, energy, and money. If we must squander one, let it be money, because only this can be replenished. Time and energy are lost forever. Hear what Ben Franklin had to say about time and its value. If you want to know whether you're going to be a success in your calling, the test is easy. Can you organize and control your time? If not, drop out, for you will surely fail. You may not think so, but you will, as surely as you live. The successful college student has his work in the palm of his hand at all times. Everything that is to be accomplished is completed on time, without a hitch. A schedule is maintained. There are no loose ends and very few regrets. I have two favorite hobbies, flying and scuba diving shipwrecks. I would be able to afford neither the time nor the money for these if I had not learned as a young man to get up in the morning, organize my day, and live on a schedule. Because we live on a schedule whether we like it or not. If it's an organized schedule, we will be effective. If not, we are the losers. Genius is the willingness to work intensively, perseveringly. Isn't it a shame that in so many areas of society today, concepts of questionable value have replaced those that have become time-proven? For example, for many people, the word relax seems to have more importance than the word try. Spend has replaced save. Consuming has taken precedence over producing. And the idea of having a good time has replaced the idea of achieving something. Charles Wilson, former president of General Electric Corporation, said this not too long ago. People who fail to achieve what they want in life simply don't want it badly enough to do the hard work. There just ain't no golden chariot to take them there. The lazy pseudo-sophisticate will tell you that this Horatio Alger stuff is outdated. But I question that fact. Horatio Alger is working steadily today in every walk of life, just as positively as ever. And by the way, I see nothing wrong with the principle of strive and succeed, the principle that underlies all progress that was ever achieved in this great country. 
One day not too long ago, an ambitious young student asked a successful merchant the secret of success, and the merchant answered, There is no easy or simple secret. You must be on the alert for little things and jump at opportunities. But the young man questioned further, How can I tell the opportunities when they come? You can't, said the merchant. You just have to keep jumping. And so it is with our genius. He just keeps jumping and working to capacity. Any student who goes about getting his education in a half-hearted way with the attitude that luck is against him will find that his luck is against him and always will be. Success will not wait around and then rush in without effort on your part. Success will come to you because you compel it. We achieve because we plan and prepare, because we believe we can achieve, because we believe in ourselves. And finally, the genius has vision, because he knows that a man must have a vision of what he can be and recognize that the only thing that can stand in the way of the things he wants to do with his life are his own psychological barriers and excuses. He knows that there's magic in believing in himself. You might call our genius a going concern because he knows where he's going. He really wants to get there. He believes that he can and he's willing to take action. On the other side of this record, we talked about positive attitudes and their relationship to you and your success in college. We spoke of the rewards of success and the penalties of failure. We emphasized that the power of genius is in every one of you and can be expressed through your own attitudes toward the importance of decision, the importance of imagination, the importance of time control, but above all, the willingness to give full measure the willingness to go the extra mile in your quest for college success. A few years ago, a Dutch airliner crashed off the coast of Scotland. When the authorities investigated, they found that the pilot simply had the wrong map, one that did not show the power lines. And aren't many of us like this airliner? Don't we frequently have the wrong map? Don't we detour and backtrack and fail to make up our minds as to where we want to go and the road we wish to follow. We have to have a plan. We have to have that correct map. So let's get it. Let's formulate an eight-point plan for your coming college years. It's a plan that I used successfully through seven years of college. It brought me honors, whereas before I'd known only failure. Before we can start, however, We've got to determine that you really want this thing called a college education more than anything else in the world, that your desire for success in this venture is great enough to transcend all other wishes. Now I'm going to make a suggestion. It's simply this. Throw idle wishing and wanting right out the window because they simply are not strong enough. They will not compel success. You must want what you want with a burning passion when you can generate the white heat of desire for a college education, then you're in a position to get it. A few days ago, I had lunch with the owner of one of the finest college bookstores in the Midwest. He told me of a young man who was struggling through college. With sadness in his voice, he outlined the problems of this student. Not only did he lack the money, but he apparently had neither intellect nor aptitude for college. By all standards, I was told he should have been a street sweeper. Naturally curious, I asked about the outcome of this lad's venture. Then with a twinkle in his eye, my friend replied, Oh, he graduated with honors. He's in medical school now. This is a true story. And of course, total desire was the key to total success. Dr. Fred Banning 
The brilliant Canadian who discovered insulin as the cure for diabetes was not really brilliant at all. He was stubborn. But above all, he was imbued with an insatiable desire to wipe out the dread sugar death. He burned his bridges, gave up his practice, for one reason and one reason only. He had the white heat of desire, a penetrating passion to stamp out the most dread disease of his day. He was successful only because of this total, all-consuming desire, and because of it, he was finally able to isolate the mysterious X factor when the finest physiologists in the world had failed. Back in 1893, the great Chicago fire destroyed the small store of Marshall Field. Now let me pose this question. Did Marshall Field sit back and say, perhaps I'll build another store? No, not at all. He said, on that spot I will build the greatest store in the world. And Napoleon said this about himself. I have succeeded because I have willed it. I have never hesitated. This has given me a distinct advantage over the rest of mankind. Success is intensity. It matters not whether you are in war, business, research, or college. The man who gets what he wants goes after it with the purpose of a cat stalking a mouse, with every muscle tense with determination. Remember, Wishing is not enough, wanting is not enough, and hoping is not anywhere near sufficient. If your desire to finish college is underscored with white heat, you'll be able to do it. You'll be able to carry out your plans and follow through with proper action. You will never have to worry about failure. Make your master thought, I will succeed. And now you're ready for your program. Whether your ultimate goal is a Bachelor of Arts, Bachelor of Science, Engineering, Nursing, or perhaps a medical degree, it makes no difference. It will work for you regardless of the final goal you wish to attain. At no time will I tell you that it will be easy, that you will sail this ship without some sacrifice on your part. We all know that anything worth having does not come easy. Here is your eight-point program for your success in college. Rule number one, never cut a class. There are two reasons for this. First, you are under observation at all times by your instructors and the administrative faculty. Opinions, good and bad, will be formed about you, both as a student and a member of the college community. Your attendance record will be the barometer of that opinion. Should you have difficulty with a particular course and find yourself on the borderline at any time, an excellent attendance record will greatly enhance your position. Second, you will be controlling your work instead of your work controlling you. You simply do not have time to chase around looking for someone with the proper lecture notes. Even if you find your so-called benefactor with the notes, you get a second-hand interpretation, which is at best half safe. 100% attendance is very much like the life preserver. It will keep you afloat. Let's not drown in a sea of confusion. If you never willingly cut the first class, you will form no bad habits, and therefore you will have no great problems. Rule number two. Recopy your rough handwritten notes the same day of the lecture, so that they will always be in first class order. It is no problem to do this if you will keep two notebooks for each course and insist on doing it each day before going on to other areas of interest. There is also a fringe benefit here. By rewriting your notes, by reorganizing and getting points in their proper order, you will have studied without realizing it. Rule number three. Set your own timetables. Get organized and stay organized. Make your motto a time for everything and everything in its own time. Allow nothing to interfere with your schedules. I have known men who have lost businesses to golf courses, and I've known students who have lost college degrees over bridge tables. No one wants or expects you to miss any of the fun of college, the dances, picnics, and football, but remember to keep everything in its proper place. Not only will you complete more work, but you'll have a lot more fun. 
No responsible person can really enjoy his leisure time if he has a hundred unfinished things hanging over his head. Work in work time and play in play time. Rule number four. Schedule your work and work your schedule. Set deadlines. All business executives set deadlines for work to be completed, and so can you. If a term paper or laboratory experiment is due for a particular Friday, set your personal deadline for Tuesday of that week. Then you will never find yourself in the position of turning in a sloppy, last-minute piece of work. You will have time to revise and refine if you think it's advisable. Remember, successful college students complete their work on time. There are no loose ends, therefore very few regrets. But here is a fine point to note well. Deadlines, of course, must be set and the future planned. But don't try to get through one semester or one year all at one time. Make a habit of living in daily compartments. Do a good job this day, and the weeks and semesters will take care of themselves. Thomas Carlyle put it this way, Our main task is not to worry about what lies in the distant future, but to do what lies clearly at hand. Give your very best today, and let tomorrow take care of itself. Schedule your work, and work your schedule. Rule number five. At night, just before you retire, spend three minutes writing down the three most important things that you have to do tomorrow, and tomorrow do them. This is a trick that I borrowed from industry. It will increase your efficiency by 25%. Rule number six. Get at least seven hours sleep before each examination. If you have taken the time to organize, if your notes are clear and distinct, if you have studied and worked on a regular schedule, there is no need to cram. The most valuable academic instrument that you will ever take into a final examination is a clear, uncluttered brain, and the only time-proven recipe for this is a good night's sleep. Before an examination, study after midnight is of very little value. Rule number seven, set aside one hour a week for self-analysis. A Sunday night is excellent. Put it in your time schedule. Spend 30 minutes listening to this record and 30 minutes answering these questions. Have I given my best in every class? Have I completed all assignments ahead of schedule? Have I stolen work time for play time? How can I make this week a more successful week? Rule number eight, and this is most important. Don't sell yourself short. Don't indulge in the insidious art of self-deprecation. Psychiatrists agree that the greatest sin in the world today is that of people selling themselves short, self-deprecation. There are 30,000 suicides and 100,000 more attempted suicides annually, and millions more, more slowly and more surely, kill themselves by constant self-degradation and self-humiliation. I hear people selling themselves short all the time, in business, in the professions, and in my office, how painfully often I see students undermining their chances for success by an unwarranted lack of self-esteem. Don't ever think of yourself as second rate, but rather believe. Because whatever you believe you can do, if you believe it firmly, strongly and resolutely, your mind will find a way to do it. Do you remember this? Beaten, you are. If you think you dare not, you don't. If you'd like to win but think you can't, it's almost a sense you won't. Life's battles won't always go to the stronger or faster man, but sooner or later, the one who wins is the one who thinks he can. If you believe that mediocrity is to be your lot in life, then by all means it will be. But if you believe that your ability is of the excellence that commands attention, and that your work is of the caliber that commands respect, and if you believe in your own honesty, integrity, and capacity, then you can join Werner Van Braun and go to the moon. Robert Collier, biographer of Napoleon, had this to say about the little corporal. It was belief. As long as he believed in himself, his course, his star, his destiny, his success was assured. 
he was invincible. It was only when he doubted that his enemies overcame him. Belief in great results is the driving force behind every great book, every play, and every great scientific discovery. Belief in success is at work in every successful business, church, and political organization, and it is the one basic essential ingredient in every successful college student. So here we are. We know where we're going. We really want to get there. We believe that we can, but it's all worthless unless we are willing to act in our own behalf unless we are willing to be self-starters. A psychologist recently interviewed 3,000 people over a two-year period. He asked them all the same question. What do you have to live for? The results were amazing. 94% merely endured the present while waiting for the future, waiting for someone to die, waiting to grow up, waiting to get out of college, waiting for a ship to come in. And don't most of us wait for tomorrow rather than living and accomplishing today? Let's begin to live at our best right now, today. Knowledge is not power at all. It's power only when it's put to constructive use. Any idea or concept is not worth a tinker's dam unless it's coupled with persistent action. The stethoscope is worthless to the physician unless he's listening to heart sounds and the finest high-speed drill in the world is of no use to a dentist unless he's cutting enamel. And your brain will be of no significant value to you unless it's doing the job that it was designed to do. Get rid of the beast of inertia. Make a firm and stalwart resolution to be a man of action, characterized by the ability to get the job done when it has to be done, whether you like it or not. I have heard a leader described as a man who knows where he wants to go and gets up and goes. It's just that simple, and it always will be. Remember the words of the German poet Gerda. If you lose this day loitering, it will be the same story tomorrow and the next more dilatory. Then indecision brings its own delays, and days are lost lamenting over days. Are you in earnest? Seize this very minute. What you can do or dream you can, begin it. Courage has genius, power, and magic in it. Only engage and the mind grows heated. Begin it, and the work will be completed. So make your motto, do it now. Be a self-starter. Get the job done. Commit yourself to a program of success. And after you have committed yourself, go. Go big. Go all the way. And don't ever stop to ask yourself if you should have started. Remember this, to truly succeed, a man needs a goal, a tough mind, and a soft heart. I would like to leave with you today the words of Rudyard Kipling. Old though they may be, they are the most trenchant thoughts on the subject of success that I have ever heard. If you can dream and not make dreams your master, if you can think, and not make thoughts your aim, if you can meet with triumph and disaster and treat these two impostors just the same, if you can force your heart and nerve and sinew to serve your turn long after they are gone, and so hold on when there is nothing in you except the will which says to you, hold on, if you can fill the unforgiving minute with 60 seconds worth of distance run, then yours is the earth and everything that's in it, and what is more, you'll be a man, my son. Goodbye. Good luck in your quest for college success, and God bless you.